Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. Today we're going to talk about the special case of banking in the American economy. So, banks are a special case when it comes to regulation. On the one hand, they are private business, just like toy manufacturers and steel companies, but they also play a central role in the economy and therefore affect the well-being of everybody not just their own consumers. Since 1930s, Americans have devised regulation designed to recognize the unique position banks hold. On the most important of this regulation is deposit insurance. During the Great Depression, America's economic decline was seriously aggravated when vast numbers of depositors concerned that the banks they had deposit, their savings would fail. So to withdraw their funds all at the same time, in the resulting ransom banks, depositors often lined up on the streets in panically attempt to get their money. Many banks, including ones that were operated privately, collapsed because they could not convert all their assets to cash quickly enough to satisfy depositors. As a result, the supply of funds banks could lend to business and industrial enterprise shrank, contributing to the economy decline. Deposit insurance was designed to prevent such rents on the banks. The government said it would stand behind deposits up to a certain level, around 100,000 currently. Now, if a bank appears to be in financial trouble, depositors no longer have to worry. The government's bank insurance agency, known as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, pays all of the depositors using funds collected as insurance premiums from the banks themselves. If necessary, the government also will use general tax revenues to protect depositors from losses. To protect the government from undue financial risk, regulators supervise banks and other corrective actions if the banks are found to be taking undue risks. The New Deal of 1930s era also gave rise to rules preventing banks from engaging in the securities and insurance business. Prior to the depression, many banks ran into trouble because they took expensive risks in the stock market or provided loans to industrial companies in which bank directors or officers had personal investments. Determined to prevent that from happening again, Depression-era politicians enacted the Glass-Steagall Act, which prohibited the mixing of banking, securities and insurance business. Such regulation grew controversial in the 1970s. However, as banks complained that they would lose customers to other financial companies unless they could offer a wider variety of financial services. The government responded by giving banks greater freedom to offer consumers new types of financial services. Then, in late 1999, Congress enacted the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, which repeated the class Stickle Act. The new law went beyond the considerable freedoms that banks already were enjoying to offer everything from the consumer banking to underwriting securities. It allowed banks, securities, and insurance firms to form financial conglomerates that could market a range of financial products, including mutual funds, stocks and bonds, insurance, and automobile loans. As with laws deregulating transportation, telecommunications, and other industries, the new law was expected to generate a wave measures among financial insisters. Generally, the New Deal legislation was successful, and the American bank system returned to health in the years following World War II. But it ran into difficulties again in the 1980s and 1990s, in part because of social regulation after the war uh, in the year following World War II. 
The government had been engaged to foster home ownership, so it helped create a new budget sector, the saving and loan industry, to concentrate on marketing long-term home phones, known as mortgages. Saving and loans faced one major problem. Mortgages typically ran for 30 years, gave fixed interest rates, while most deposits have much shorter terms. When short-term interest rate was above the rate on long-term mortgages, savings and loans can lose money. To protect savings and loan associations and banks against the eventually regulation decide to control interest rates on deposits. For a while, the system worked well. In the 1960s and 1970s, almost all Americans got C and L financing for buying their homes. Interest rate paid on deposits at CNLs were kept low, but billions of Americans put their money in them because deposit insurance made them an extremely safe place to invest. Stating in the 1960s, however, general interest rate level began rising with inflation. By the 1980s, many depositors started seeking higher return by putting their savings into money markets funds in other non-bank assets. This put banks' savings and loans in a dire financial squeeze, unable to attract new deposits to cover their large portfolios of long-term loans. Responding to their problems, the government in the 1980s began a gradual phasing out of interest rate, ceiling on bank and CL deposit. But while this helped the institutors attract deposits again, it produced large and widespread losses on CL's mortgage portfolios, which were, for the most part, earning lower interest rates and CL's now were paying depositors. Again, responding to complaints, Congress requested restriction on lending so that CL's would could make higher earning investments. In particular, Congress allowed CL's to change in consumers, business, and commercial real estate lending. They also labelized some regulatory producers coveting how much capital sales would have to hold. Fearful of becoming obsolete, sales expanded into highly risky activities such as speculative real estate ventures. In many cases, these ventures proved to be unprofitable, especially when economic the conditions turned unfavorable. Indeed, some seers were taken over by unsavory people who plundered them. Many seers ran up huge losses. Government was slow to detect the unfolding crisis because budgetary strategy and political pressures combined to shrink regulation stops. The CL's squeezes in a few years mushroomed into the biggest national financial scandal in American history. By the end of the decade, large numbers of CL's had crumbled into insolvency. About half of the CL's that had been in business in the 1970s no longer existed in 1989. The Federal Saving and Loan Insurance Corporation, which insured depositors' money, itself became insolvent. In the 1989 Congress and the President agreed on taxpayer financial bailout measure known as Financial Institution Reform, Recovery and Enforcement Act. This act provided $50 billion to close failed sales, totally change the regulatory efforts for saving institutes, and imposed new portfolio constraints. A new government agency called the Resolution Trust Corporation was set up to liquidate insolvent institutions. In March 1990, another 78,000 million was pumped into the FTC, but estimates of the total cost of the CL cleanup continued to mount, topping the 200,000 million mark. So, it was about telecommunication in the American economy history.
and special case of banking. Thanks everybody for watching. Hit the like button, subscribe and notification button as well.